And uh, what I mean by congruence is basically just a whole family of curves that don't intersect. And uh, so, for, so uh, you know, at first I'll be, st uh, I'll be uh, talking about time-like curves, time-like geodesics more specifically. And then uh, at some point we'll go into the null case, which is full of subtleties and interesting features. But uh, for the time being, it's going to be time-like curves, time-like geodesics. And again, the, the whole idea is that a congruence is a family of non-intersecting uh, non uh, non curves. And if we're talking about geodesics specifically, we could be talking about curves that are, you know, that are not geodesics, but you know, uh, for uh, our purposes here, we're going to be talking about uh, geodesics. So we're talking about a family of non-intersecting geodesics. If we do have points of intersection, then we have a singularity of the congruence, and that's something we'll talk about. But those are exceptional cases that uh, you know, we'll basically rule out uh, as part of the definition here. So uh, here's one of the time-like geodesics. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's a fourth one. And what you have to imagine here is that I'm really filling three-dimensional space, uh, you know, comp you know I'm, I'm filling it up with, uh, with curves, and we have curves basically everywhere. So at every spatial point, we have a curve that passes through that point, and only one curve that passes through that point because uh, that's the non-intersecting um, um, uh, condition. So we have a whole you know, family of curves like this, and what we're going to be trying to do here is to describe the behavior of these curves uh, in reference to one of them. So we're going to pick one of them we are going to call it a reference geodesic, and then what I want to do is to describe the behavior of neighboring geodesics using our deviation vector that we talked about last week as, uh, as the main tool to do that. You had a question? Um, sorry, I didn't quite so get that. You're, you're saying geodesics don't intersect. Yeah. But that's only in, if you're working on a plane. Uh, no, I'm thinking about this in three-dimensional space. So I, I pick a point in three-dimensional space. And it's true that any one geodesic can go in any direction through that point. Uh, but the point is that there's only one geodesic passing through that point. In my family, so uh, I'm, I'm talking about the whole family. You pick a congruence. It, like, there are geodesics which pass each other, obviously, but you pick like a flow that such that I, I pick a family, oh, okay. and for that family, of course, you know, I can have other geodesics passing through those points, but they're not part of my family. So the family only has those uh, geodesics non intersecting. So, uh, so we're going to have one, uh, you know. Uh, geodesic that's going to be a reference, and then uh, a reference geodesic, and then we're going to have a bunch of neighboring geodesics. And we're going to be working locally. And what I want to do is to describe the behavior of the, uh, of the uh, neighboring geodesics through the behavior of the deviation vector that we introduced last time and uh, will be basically the essential ingredient in our description. So I'll come back to that. Uh, what we're going to be basically deriving here are evolution equations for the deviation vector, and we're going to see what they, uh, what they tell us. What I want to do first, though, just to introduce the scene a bit, is to do something like that, but in a more familiar, maybe, uh, setting. And we're going to go back to you know, 3D Newtonian physics, and we're going to be doing this just to introduce the scene again uh, in, uh, in the context of fluid mechanics. So let me explain why I want to do this, and then, uh, then we'll pursue, that for a little, uh, pursue this for a little while and see where that uh, leads us. So let me just say that this is to be continued. And uh, I'm going to take a tangential path here and do something a little bit different. So let's talk about 3D Newtonian fluid mechanics. 
So here's the, th here's the thing. So I'm still going to have, you know, I'm going to display, a, uh, you know, a space-time diagram here uh, just for illustrating what I want to, uh, introducing what I want to talk about. So let me consider a time, you know, T1, say, and let's consider a fluid configuration at that time. So here's where it is. So this is just, you know, some fluid configuration. at that time. Now, what you do in fluid dynamics is to say that uh, in your fluid, you know, your fluid is just decomposed into a whole bunch of fluid elements, and you associate you know, a fluid element with a point in space. So each point in space basically has a fluid element around it, and that fluid element you know, is one of those things that's supposed to be very small on macroscopic scales, but very large on microscopic scales, so that you can still have a whole bunch of molecules inside each fluid element. And each fluid element will have, you know, its own density, its pressure. It will go in some direction with some velocity. So all of those things are, uh, you know, basic ingredients of fluid mechanics. So over here, for example, we have one fluid element. And over there, we have another fluid element. So this is a fluid element. And what you do in fluid mechanics is as the system evolves, as the fluid configuration evolves in time, you follow, you track the motion of each fluid element. So you can imagine, for example, that you take all the molecules in here and you paint them red, and you follow all the red molecules as the system evolves in time. And those ones over here are going to be painted blue, and you follow the blue molecules as, uh, as the system evolves in time. And the collection of blue molecules is going to be the fluid element at all times. The collection of red molecules is going to be the fluid element, uh, you know, at all times. So at a later time up here, you know, the fluid configuration will have changed. You know, pressure will be, you know, acting. Uh, external forces might be acting. I really don't care what's going on here. What I care about is that I can track this fluid element in time, and I will know that at a later time it's going to be up here, and this one is going to be up here somewhere. And thinking about this, uh, what we're saying is that, well, each fluid element will trace a word line in, you know, 3 plus 1 uh, space time. So we have a word line passing through here that tracks the motion of the red molecules, and we have another word line through here that tracks the motion of that fluid element. So those word lines that, pass, you know, that basically uh, tell us about the behavior of fluid elements is an example of a congruence. So what I'll do for the next little while is that I'll think in terms of fluid dynamics, but eventually I'll just abstract away the fluid, but we're going to keep the curves. And, uh, and we're going to be thinking about the behavior of the curves, but the intuition we're going to have by playing around with the fluid stuff uh, I think will be useful. So you see where where I'm going, so the, the connection between the two things. Yep. So just one clarification. These uh, fluid configurations cannot tear apart in the middle of our own internal dynamics. So. Uh, that would be a singularity of, uh, of, of the fluid dynamics, so I'm, I'm going to rule this out. So it would be a case where you might, well, you might generate holes or things like that, or, yeah, so I'm, I'm just assuming that this doesn't happen. So basically, we have, a, uh, we have you know, a bunch of curves like this that track the motion of fluid elements. And I could call this one the reference element. And I could you know, look at this one and say that it's a neighboring fluid element. And there's going to be a displacement vector between the two that I'm going to call C. And this will be C as a function of time, because as the fluid configuration changes, the distance between this fluid element and the reference fluid element changes. So C, as a function of time, is the displacement between uh, a given fluid element and, uh, and the reference fluid element. And of course, if I say that this is you know, position x1, and if I say that this is position x0, well, C is just going to be, you know, in three-dimensional space, the difference between the two positions. 
So uh, that's something I can do in Newtonian physics that simplifies the discussion. That's something, of course, that I would never do in curved space-time because we don't have this notion of a vector that points from point to point. Okay. So uh, here's the uh, so that was the uh, the uh, definition of the displacement vector in this case of fluid, uh, in the case of fluid dynamics. A question that I could be asking then is, well, what is going to be the relative velocity between the fluid elements? So the relative velocity between those two fluid elements, well, clearly it's going to be the time derivative of that displacement vector. And it's going to be the velocity field of the fluid evaluated at x1 minus the velocity field of the fluid evaluated at x0. So by velocity field, I mean that if I pick a fluid element and I track it, I know it's going to be moving with some speed in some direction. So if I pick this one, it's going to be moving you know, with some speed in some direction. This one is also going to be with some, you know, moving with some speed in some direction. So for each fluid element, I have a, you know, I have a vector, uh, a velocity vector. And therefore, I have a velocity vector that varies with spatial position, also with time. I didn't indicate the, the time dependence. And that's what I mean by a velocity field for each point within the fluid. I look at what the, uh, what the fluid element is doing, and that's, you know, that's how I define my velocity uh, at that point. So in the space-time uh, thing, we're going to have something you know, analogous to that that we're going to be tracking also when we look at the relative behavior of, uh, of two neighboring geodesics. So uh, if I'm talking about large displacements, of course, I have to leave it at that. If I'm talking about small displacements, what I can do is to do a Taylor expansion about x naught, And because x naught is my reference point, and because I'm talking about neighboring uh, geodesics, I'm going to do a Taylor expansion and keep things to leading order. So in components, I can say that the J component of the relative velocity is just going to be, well, the V component of the velocity, the J component of the velocity field evaluated at X naught plus C minus the velocity field at X naught. And uh, I can do the Taylor expansion. Uh, and from this guy, I get Vj comma k ck plus higher order terms in c that I'm going to ignore. So we're going to be talking about small displacements. And what I have here is uh, you know, an equation that tells us that the rate of change of the vector c is to leading order proportional to c itself times something in front which is the gradient of the velocity field evaluated at x naught. Okay? So that's really the starting point of the whole discussion, and we're going to see where that leads us uh, and what the, you know, what the counterpart will be to that in the, uh, in the congruence uh, discussion. So let me just rewrite this. I'm going to say that dc dt is going to be some matrix bjk multiplying c and I forget high order terms, and bjk is the gradient of the velocity field evaluated on the reference, um, on the reference uh, fluid element at that time. Uh, it, you know, it depends on time, but it's always evaluated at a fixed position. So I should indicate the time dependence here and the times time dependence here. So evaluated at the reference fluid element. So no mystery so far? OK. So the whole point is that I want to investigate the nature of that matrix. So uh, B, J, K is going to be some 3 by 3 matrix. And in general, I cannot expect that this uh, matrix will have any symmetries. So uh, a tool that's always uh, you know, used in those situations is that you just break it down into its smallest pieces. Uh, fan a fancier way of saying this is that you just break down the matrix into its irreducible pieces, and you look at each piece separately. And then when you know what each piece is doing, 
uh, you put it all together. So we're going to decompose. So this is uh, a matrix without symmetries. So we're going to decompose it into irreducible pieces. And that's something we're going to do also in the, um, in the space-time version of this. So what do I mean by that? Let me just write it down. I'm going to break down. That's a theta. Uh, I'm going to break it down into something that's purely diagonal. And, uh, and I'm going to call this the trace part. I'm going to break it down into something else that I'm going to call the shear, uh, the uh, trace-free part, the symmetric trace-free part. And I'm going to break it down into an anti-symmetric part, omega jk. So this is going to be the trace part. This is going to be the symmetric trace-free part. And this will be the anti-symmetric part. So if you're given a matrix, first of all, you can always decompose it into symmetric and anti-symmetric pieces. That, uh, you know, that's always something you can do. So we've done that here. But in addition to that, I've taken the symmetric part and I've broken it down further into something which is pure trace, the first term, and something which is you know, symmetric but without the trace term, therefore symmetric trace-free. Yeah, because it's anti-symmetric. Right? Right. Yeah. So, um, so definitions for these things. Well, uh, theta is just, as I said, the trace of that matrix. And this follows because when you take the trace of this, you get the trace of the unit matrix, which is 3. The, the one-third is there to uh, make up for that. So you get theta from that. You get nothing from here because, uh, by definition, that's, that's uh, trace-free. And you get fr nothing from here because, as we just said, an anti-symmetric matrix will always be trace-free. So theta is defined by this relation right here. Sigma jk is going to be the symmetric part of B minus the trace part. And finally, Finally, the uh, omega uh, matrix is just going to be the anti-symmetric part of the B matrix. So basically, that's how you define these things. And when you put it back together, you get the full. So just to uh, make sure that all of that is very concrete, um, if I write it in matrix form, well, we know what this stands for. It's going to be one-third omega, uh, one-third theta here, one-third theta here, one-third theta here, and we get zero everywhere else, right? Uh, sigma ij is, is going to be another matrix, and the first requirement is that it has to be uh, symmetric. So we're going to have a sigma 1, 1 up here, sigma 1, 2 up here, sigma 1, 3 up here, but this one, of course, has to be equal to this one, right? So sigma 2, 1 has to be equal to sigma 1, 2. Uh, here, sigma 2, 2 is not constrained. And sigma 2, 3 also is not constrained. This guy over here, sigma 3, 1, has to be equal to sigma 1, 3. This guy has to be equal to sigma 2, 3. And the one that's left over over here has to be such that uh, the trace vanishes. So it has to be minus the sum of 
sigma 1, 1, and sigma 2, 2. And finally, uh, omega jk has to be an anti-symmetric matrix, so there's no entry here. There's going to be an omega 1, 2 over here, an omega 1, 3 over there. Here, we're going to have minus omega 1, 2, 0, omega 2, 3, minus omega 1, 3, minus omega 2, 3, and 0. So if you count the components, we have one component up here. We have one, two, three, four, five here. It would be six for a symmetric matrix, but we remove the trace, so we get one less. And here we have one, two, three components because it's an anti-symmetric uh, matrix. And if we add this up, we get nine, and that obviously is the total number of components we had in the original B, three by three, uh, equals nine usually. So that's just a way of breaking down the matrix into its smallest possible pieces. And the next question is, well, you know, thinking still uh, about the fluid, uh, what is each piece going to do on the fluid? You know, let's think about what, what each piece is doing, and then we can you know, put it all back together, and that's going to be the action of the full B. Right? So no questions so far? Okay, good. So this, this, uh, this decomposition is something we'll encounter also in the, uh, the uh, space-time discussion. Okay. Let's think about the expansion. And of course, I've chosen the words. Um, oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't call them here. So this is called the expansion. Theta is called the expansion. This guy is called the shear tensor. And this, call, uh, this guy is called the rotation tensor. And the names, obviously, are very suggestive, so I just want to uh, bring this out. Okay, theta is the trace of B, which is the velocity gradient, which means that in traditional notation, it's just the divergence of the vector field uh, attached to the fluid. And that, you know, if you've done fluid mechanics before, you'll recognize as the rate of expansion of fluid elements as they move around the fluid. But that's what I want to, uh, you know, I just want to spend a little bit of time, uh, you know, describing this. So the claim is that this is the rate of expansion of the um, volume of fluid elements. And I should say fractional <coughs> rate of expansion. Okay. So one property of my fluid elements is that as I keep tracking the molecules like this and keep the, uh, the fluid elements uh, under scrutiny, uh, well, first of all, so the, the fluid element always captures the same number of, uh, of molecules. So we have number conservation, but I don't care about that. I mean, it's true, but I don't care about it. As I keep tracking the molecules, the mass contained in a given fluid element is conserved, and that I care about. So we're gonna, I'm going to use conservation of mass here as a way of explaining where the expansion comes from. What is not conserved is the volume of each fluid element. So as I keep tracking the molecules, well, depending on what the fluid is doing, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the size of the fluid element will change in time. It may expand, it may contract as I keep tracking the same number of molecules. The shape also will change, and we'll talk about shape changes uh, when we talk about the shear. But right now, I want to keep track of how much volume is contained in a fluid element. Of course, we're talking about, in, you know, infinitesimal volumes in this case. So I'm going to introduce mass conservation as the way to address this, and mass conservation is expressed by the continuity equation. 
So we have a mass density, which is the amount of mass contained uh, in a fluid element uh, divided by its volume. And we also have a mass current, which is going to be uh, rho uh, multiplying by the velocity vector. So that's the current density associated with, uh, with the mass. And the continuity equation is well contained in the statement that the partial rate of change of rho with respect to time is going to be the divergence of the current density. And that's the equation I have here. So you've all seen that a long time ago, mostly in the context of ENM. Uh, in ENM, that would describe charge conservation. Here, we're talking about mass conservation. So, uh, so my density here is the density of mass. OK, so let me just write this out in a slightly different form. So uh, what I'm going to do is to expand this. Uh, I'm going to just uh, propagate the differential operator here. So first, I'm going to get rho that multiplies the divergence of v. And then I'm going to get v that multiplies the gradient of rho. And what I'm going to do is to lump those two things together and throw the other one over to the left, to the right-hand side. That's the thing I want to have a look at, because that's the thing that's related to my expansion uh, parameter, right? my expansion quantity. Do you recognize the left-hand side? I'll take that as a no. This is the total time derivative of the density as I follow the motion of the fluid element. Let me just explain that. As we follow a given fluid element, And we ask, so for example, so at t equals, um, okay, at t equals, so let's focus on this fluid element over here. I'm going to be asking what is the density at, uh, at t and what is the density at a later time t plus delta t. The density at t is obviously going to be the density of the fluid at the position of my fluid element. At t plus dt, the density of the same fluid element is going to be what the density will be at the later time, obviously. But I have to account for the motion of the fluid element in space, right? Because the fluid element is going to be displaced relative to its previous position. So what I have to do is to evaluate the density at the right spot, which is the new spot of that fluid element. The total change, d rho, is going to be the difference between those two things. And that is something I can evaluate as a Taylor expansion. So I get the partial derivative with respect to t multiplying dt. And then I get dx multiplying the gradient of the velocity, uh, of the density. And then, of course, there would be higher order terms that I don't care about when I take the limit. And therefore, if I differentiate with respect, if I divide with respect to dt, I get dx divided by dt, which is clearly the, you know, the velocity of the fluid element, multiplying delta rho. So that combination is the total time derivative of my density if I follow the motion of the fluid element. 
if I don't follow the motion of the fluid element and I just ask what is the time derivative of the density always here at this particular spot in space, then I get that. I get the partial derivative of rho with respect to t. But if I say that I'm going to be tracking the motion of the fluid element as it moves from here to there while I take the time derivative, then I have to include this term as well. So usually this, I mean, this is something that always occurs in fluid dynamics, and it's sometimes called the convective derivative uh, of the density. For us, it's something we should recognize because, you know, in a non-relativistic setting, this is an approximation for rho differentiated in the direction of the four velocity of the fluid element. Because in a non-relativistic setting, the four velocity would be approximately given to given equal, you know, would be approximately equal to one in the time direction and equal to the uh, you know spatial velocity in the spatial component. So this derivative and this derivative is basically tracking the changes as you follow the motion of the fluid element, or more generally, as you follow the word line of some, you know, the word line of something, right? So this is something we expect. I mean, this is something we've seen a lot, or that we'll see a lot in GR that we, you know, recognize as coming from, say, a GR context, but it's really something that more fundamentally just describes a time derivative that keeps track of the motion of our fluid element. All right? OK. OK, so now we're back here, and we see what's going on. We have the, uh, we have the result that that quantity over here, which I was interested in, is minus 1 over rho d rho dt. So the divergence of the, of the velocity field has to do with, uh, you know, a change in the density as uh, we keep track of the, uh, of the fluid element. And, if, and the density can only change if the mass can't change within a fluid element. The density can only change if we have a change in volume. So the next step and the, la the last step here is just to rewrite this in terms of the delta V that I introduced before. And obviously, uh, you know, if I differentiate delta V, uh, if I differentiate rho and dm is constant, then I produce a minus sign, I produce a dV over, you know, a 1 over dV over 2, and I produce a rate of change of dV. So when you put it all together, you get rid of this minus sign, you get 1 over dV, and then what you're constructing here is the rate of change of the volume divided by volume. So it's the fractional rate of change of the volume of a fluid element. So if you have a diverging um, so a fluid that diverges, uh, so that the velocity field has an unzero, you know, a positive divergence. So if it's all going in directions like this, that you know, each fluid element is diverging away from each other, uh, well, that means that the fluid is expanding in space. And if you keep the mass constant, that means that the volume is expanding. And that's what we find here, that for a positive divergence, we get uh, a positive rate of increase of each volume for each fluid element. If the divergence is negative, that means that the fluid is converging on itself, right? The velocity field is directed inward, and that means that the, 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 the fluid is, you know, contracting in space, and that means that each fluid element in that case would be uh, contracting as well, and uh, this would be negative when this is negative. So bottom line is that our expansion parameter is the fractional rate of change of volume. So the whole scaling of the fluid is described, you know, by uh, by this uh, expansion parameter. 
Any questions about that? Yep? But is it only true for fluids which have no pressure? No, 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 no. Pressure has nothing to do with this. Pressure will tell us how the fluid elements move, right? So, so a pressure gradient across a fluid element will tell us that there's an acceleration on each fluid element. But, but as a term, the Cartesian equation. No, 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 no. Mass conservation is, you know, strictly uh, given by the continuity equation. Other questions? Okay, let me talk about the shear. And to talk about the shear, uh, what I'm going to do is to pretend that this, uh, this is zero over here. We know what this is. Now we know what it does. Uh, I'm going to pretend that this is zero. So I'm just going to rewrite this equation, pretending that the only thing that's acting is the shear tensor. So I'm going to set theta equals 0, and I'm going to set the uh, rotation tensor to be equal to 0. And now the evolution equation for my deviation vector is just going to be given by the shear tensor. The shear tensor, we understand, is, uh, did I lose my listing of components, is uh, a symmetric trace free tensor. Now, I have five uh, independent components for sigma, and I have a whole bunch of equations, so that's a little bit more complicated than, uh, than it needs to be. So just to simplify uh, the discussion, I'm going to assume that there's only one, you know, that most of those guys here are zero, and that there's only one surviving component. And we're going to look at that, and we're going to see what's going on. So let's take uh, sigma 1, 2 and from now on I'll just call it sigma, to be the only non-vanishing component. Just for the sake of this uh, discussion. So I can do that. Uh, I can pretend that all the other ones are zero, and I still have a symmetric trace free tensor, but now instead of having five individual components, I've boiled it down to just one. And clearly we can repeat this discussion for each one separately, and it's going to be the same story all over again, so we'll just do it once. Okay, so now if I, uh, if I write this in full, so sigma 1, 2 will couple only the x and y components of my uh, deviation vector. So boiled down, I have that the rate of change of, uh, of Cx is going to be sigma times Cy, and the rate of change of Cy is going to be minus, uh, is going to be plus sigma Cx. So let's try to see what this gives us. So I'm going to be plotting Cx and Cy. And just to see what this gives us, let's assume that we have a collection of fluid elements that forms a nice circle in that plane. So the reference fluid element is still at the center, and now I'm considering a whole bunch of neighboring fluid elements uh, that at some time are you know, uh, giving us the form of a circle. So we have uh, you know, fluid elements in the shape of a circle, and that's going to be the initial shape at, you know, at the initial time. And I want to see what the chain, what the you know shape is going to shape into, uh, as we uh, let you know the shear act. Uh, you know, so what's going to happen at a later time? Okay. Well, basically, all I have to ask is, uh, what is going to be the displacement, the change in the deviation vector that's described by this? So per unit time. So for example, if I take a fluid element over here then sigma y is 0, so that there's no displacement along x. But sigma x is equal to you know, this unit, and that means that there's going to be a displacement along y. Right? So this fluid element over here is going to be pushed upward a little bit, like that. That's the, you know, that's the action. That's the, you know, that's the meaning of those uh, differential equations. They tell us 
what's going to happen in the next uh, in the next moment. If I take a fluid element up here, then these guys are going to be equal, and we're going to generate equal displacements in both x and y. So in that case, the displacement is going to be this way. If we're up here, then there's uh, no displacement along y, but there's going to be a displacement along x. It's going to be pushing this way. So we just keep going like this, and I think you'll see where this is going. So if we're over here, then the displacement in y is positive, but the displacement in x is negative. So we get something positive from here, something negative from here. So now we get a displacement that goes this way. And we keep going like this. If we're here, um, sorry, if we're over here, it gets pushed down. If it's over here, it gets pushed in that direction. And if it's over here, um, no, sorry. If we're down here, it's going to be negative in both, uh, in both directions, so we're really going this way. If it's down here, then uh, so this guy is 0, no displacement along y, but we get a negative displacement along x, so we go this way. And the last one over here is going this way. So as we, uh, just give me a sec, as, yeah, what? Well, might as well. Oh, yeah, that's in the wrong direction. Right, so this one over here, we get, uh, we get 0 for x, we get 1 for uh, y, so we get a displacement along x, which is positive, so it goes this way. Very good. So what shape is this giving us? Well, we just join the points, right? So it gives us something like this. And, well, it's not pretty, but it basically describes an ellipse. So the effect of the shear tensor, and here we've picked one component of that, is to you know, take a circular shape in the fluid, and as time evolves, it will shear it. It will squeeze one direction, stretch the other direction uh, in, uh, in the shape of an ellipse. And you know, we've, you know, we've played this game in one, you know, in one dimension, or, I mean, we played this game with one parameter, but if you played this game with you know, all the other parameters in turn, you would get ellipses in various orientations. And if you put it all together, you would find that you get some ellipse in some direction, uh, but you will always you know, distort a sphere into something that's elongated, like an ellipse that's going to be squeezed in one direction and elongated in the other direction. That's the effect of the shear tensor. It just deforms uh, the, fluid, the neighboring fluid configuration into something which uh, is you know squeezed and elongated with respect to the initial shape, and uh, an important property of this is that well you can actually prove from uh, from the relations here that uh, the distortion does not affect the volume. So as you squeeze the circle into an ellipse, uh, you can show that the you know volume or here the area uh, inside the shape is going to be preserved. So there is no. So there's a you know. There's a deformation of shape without a change in volume. So in the book, I go through that in you know a different you know a slightly different context. Uh, so you can uh, you can read about that. Uh, you can also play around with you know different parameters, see how they would affect uh, things. But all that changes basically is that you change the uh, you know you change the orientation, you change the uh, the axes. But what you always get is you know a given shape that gets distorted. And if you start with the circle, you get an ellipse, and uh, that's the role of the shear tensor. It basically takes a you know a spherical fluid element, well a collection of fluid elements around the neighboring fluid elements. You know so you take a shape around your, uh, your, uh, your reference fluid element, and that shape gets distorted as the fluid evolves in time. Okay. Any mysteries about any of this? Okay, so that's the shear, and we can do something very similar for the rotation.
uh, the rotation, uh, so here again, I'm going to kill off a whole bunch of components just to simplify things. So first of all, we're going to set uh, the expansion equal to zero, and we're going to say now that the shear is equal to zero. So we're going to focus on the, um, on the uh, rotation. And uh, also, I'm going to take um, omega 1, 2 again to be, and I'm going to call it omega, uh, is the only non-vanishing component. which means that my equations now for uh, the CDT are going to be almost the same as what I had before for the shear, but now there's going to be a crucial minus sign in the second equation. So let's do the same thing. Let's consider a whole bunch of fluid elements around our reference fluid element, and let's give them initially the shape of a circle in that plane, and let's play the same game. If we're here, then uh, this displacement is zero, this guy is, uh, sorry, this guy is zero, this guy is non-zero, it's equal to the unit, and I get the displacement in the negative direction along y. So in this case, I'm pushed this way. If I'm over here, I get a positive displacement here and a negative displacement here. So I get something that's pushed, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, it's uh, positive here, it's negative here, so, uh, so I go this way. This guy, uh, so this guy now is zero, so my displacement is along x. Um, something is not right. This guy is okay. This guy is fine. Oh no, sorry, what am I talking about? It goes this way. All right, uh, this guy, okay, so now it's negative uh, in x and positive in y. So this guy is positive, this guy is positive also. So we go this way. So you see how it goes, right? It's always going tangent along the circle. So you can take my word for it that the displacements are always um, tangent. And basically all you're doing, uh, whoa. <laughs> Sorry about all this confusion. That would be very wrong. Tangent in the same direction. Now what have I done? Yeah, okay. So basically all you're doing is to take the circle and you just rotate it on itself, right? That's what the equations mean. So here you take that spherical shape and then uh, you see that in time it continues to be a spherical shape, but now you see that there's an overall rotation that gets built up. And then as you keep following that in time, uh, it will continue to build up. And uh, omega then describes the rate of rotation. It's really the angular velocity uh, associated with that rotation. So this is just a rotation of the, uh, of the original shape without distortion. And then if you play around again with, you know, different of those parameters uh, with, uh, you know, alternative uh, parameters, then you'll find that you also have rotations, but they would be rotations in different directions. And uh, the most common thing when you combine all three, uh, you know, all three rotation parameters is the fact that, well, you can just, you know, you can take a spherical ball and you can rotate it in arbitrary directions. And, uh, but in all cases, you'll find that you get a rotation in some direction by some angle uh, at, uh, you know, without introducing a distortion of the shape. 
So now that we have all that, well, we can go back to this uh, decomposition over here, and we can, uh, we can put it all together, and we know what B is going to be doing. B is going to be basically a combination of all those elementary transformations that we talked about. In general, there will be an expansion, either you know, positive or negative, so there will be a scaling of the fluid that, um, that's described by the trace term over here. There's going to be a distortion in the shape of, uh, of neighboring you know, fluid elements uh, relative to the, uh, to the reference fluid element, so that's described by the, uh, the, by the shear tensor. And in addition to that, the whole thing is going to be rotating so in general, you have a rich behavior, but if you break it down into pieces like that, you can understand each piece, and you know, uh, you know precisely what they mean. Yep? The higher orders of, of seeing that expansion, does that give any extra information? Uh, yeah, so if you really wanted to, uh, to extend this to higher order, then of course you would have more pieces. To, so you, know, you, you would have another uh, B field that would have now three indices to it. Uh, you could also decompose that into re reducible pieces, but now the transformations would be m much more complicated. So here we're dealing with linear transformations, which are simple. Uh, if you want to keep extra terms, it would be much, uh, you know, uh, much more involved in terms of the description. Uh, there, um, you know, that you, you can find that being done in uh, places like uh, elasticity theory. If you read old books on elasticity theory, you'll find that they'll. They'll do that. They'll actually go to higher order, and it's a mess, it's a big mess. Uh, in GR, certainly we won't do that. We'll be happy to keep it at first order because, in fact, it will turn out to be exact at first order, so we don't need to worry about higher order terms. So that's an advantage of GR versus you know, fluid mechanics or, uh, or elasticity theory. Was there another? Yeah, yeah, another so, question. So this rotation gives rise to twisting effect as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, by rotation, I really mean a twisting of the. So you, you can imagine that the that the word lines are just twisting on themselves, like that. Yeah. Okay, so we're all good with that. So of course, the point of all this is that while, you know, this is a sort of more um, elementary setting uh, where we can understand these things, I think, and rely on the fluid behavior that we have some you know intuition about. Uh, now I'm going to go back to the GR case. I'm going to go back to the situation where we don't have a fluid. Uh, we may have a fluid, but you know we don't have to have a fluid. And what we have instead are, are just a bunch of curves. We have this congruence of curves. But uh, none of this here really relied in a big way on the existence of the fluid. So mostly I was relying on the existence of a bunch of trajectories. So the curves were very essential to this discussion. The only place where I introduced the fluid is through this discussion right here of mass conservation that allowed me to relate the expansion to, uh, to the gradient of the velocity field. But if you think about this a little bit more deeply, what you find is that, well, this was just basically incidental. So the, uh, you know, the appeal to mass conservation in this case was just for me to simplify the discussion and relate it to something you knew, uh, namely the continuity equation. But this relationship between the gradient of the velocity field and the, uh, the fractional rate of volume, uh, rate of change of volume, as you follow a bunch of curves, is something that, in fact, is not you know, essentially tied to this discussion of mass conservation. It was just a convenient way to get there. But this is something you could derive differently without appealing to, uh, to a conversation, uh, to a conservation statement. So basically, the bottom line is that basically all of this is something that never really relied on the material properties of the fluid. I can take it out. I can take the fluid out, keep the curves, and that's the situation we have in GR, except for the fact that now we're going to do everything in space-time as opposed to you know, three-dimensional space uh, with time added. That's the only distinction. But we're going to find, in fact, that the, the uh, correspondence between this and that uh, is extremely close. And in fact, uh, the interpretation for all the space-time quantities is going to follow you know, exactly from this discussion. Uh, there, re there really is no need for introducing uh, qualifiers or you know, making conceptual changes. It's really exactly the same story. Yep, you have a question? I was just wondering about the expansion in uh, GR. So in GR, the volume, that would be like a spatial volume that that flexes on our yep. congruence? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Yeah. OK, so yeah. like that's not a Lorentz invariant, though. So it, it's data not a Lorentz invariant as well? Um, 
it is Lawrence invariant. I'll try to uh, I'll try to explain that when we get there. But you had a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just out of curiosity, in a logarithmic sweep, so you do it like four stops. Would this be different? Uh, I haven't studied non-Newtonian fluids for quite a while. Um, I think so. I, I don't think it's going to be very different. So certainly the non-Newtonian non nature of the fluid will change its dynamics a lot. So the, you know, uh, so you know the equivalent. So the the Euler equation that would be, you know, the description of the dynamics of an ideal fluid is not going to be applicable to a non-Newtonian fluid. However, I think anything that has to do with mass conservation would still be there. Anything that has to do with this way of describing things in terms of relative behavior would still hold. So I, I, I do believe that there's nothing to be changed here when you go from when you go from you know perfect fluids to non-Newtonian fluids. Uh, you can add viscosity to that without changing anything. Uh, so I think that's the answer. I mean, I I would have to go back and check whether there's any surprises. Uh, in, uh, in non-Newtonian fluids, but my belief is that you know everything carries over uh, without a change. Other questions? Okay, so let me go back now to uh, the first board. So we're going to close our parenthesis here and just go back to what we were doing before. Okay, so back to congruences. Okay, so back to this uh, diagram. I'm just going to redraw it. So we have a bunch of Geodesics, I'm just going to draw two of them for the time being. And, uh, well, we know how this works, right? We've carried out this construction before. Uh, we can do the usual thing where, first of all, having this, you know, this whole, you know, sequence of geodesics, we know that we have a vector field U, which is going to be everywhere tangent to, uh, to the congruence. So we have a tangent vector field. And you know, when we were playing around with geodesic deviation, I, stood out, I started out with two curves, and then I postulated the existence of a whole bunch of curves in between. Now it's very similar to that, except that the family gives us you know, the curves in between, so I don't have to put them in uh, artificially. They're just there, uh, you know, given by the family. So that's one slight change with respect to what we were doing before. So we have the, uh, we have the um, we have the tangent vector field. We can do the same game of introducing cross curves by looking at how uh, these curves are described parametrically, the same way we did it with the um, uh, with uh, geodesic deviation. So, uh, so we have this notion of a deviation vector, which is again defined as tangent to those cross curves. Although here the cross curves are not going to play you know an explicit role, but it's you know implicitly uh, you know given here. Uh, and I'm going to import a lot of the results we had last week when we were doing all of this for uh, geodesic deviation. So we have U alpha, which is uh, the tangent vector field. To the congruence. 
And here I'm going to assume that, so we're dealing, first of all, with time-like geodesics. I should have said that. I'm going to assume that I'm using proper time as a parameter on each geodesic. So we're going to have a vector field that satisfies the geodesic equation in the usual form. And I'm also assuming that our uh, velocity field is normalized to the usual minus one. So we have that. We have C, which is the uh, deviation vector, which we can think of as basically describing a displacement from the reference geodesic down here to a neighboring geodesic, but in the usual geometrical way of inventing these things where you introduce the cross curves and you make sure that this field, this vector field, is defined as tangent to cross curves. So it's a deviation vector field, which is tangent to cross curves. And this uh, vector field, according to all the work we did last week, will have uh, two essential properties. One is that the lead derivative of C in the direction of u is going to be equal to the lead derivative of u in the direction of c. And that means that c alpha differentiated in the direction of u is going to be the same thing as u differentiated in the direction of c. And the other property that we saw last week we could always impose is the, uh, is the statement that the deviation vector is always going to be orthogonal to the tangent vector field. So that's a freedom we had left over. Uh, you know, we proved that this was always a constant uh, as you follow uh, the congruence, and we can set the constant equal to zero by taking out the you know, component of C that might have been originally in the direction of U. We can take this out. We've done that. And uh, we're going to assume that, you know, that this condition can be so basically, all of this is imported from uh, the discussion we had last week about geodesic uh, deviation. I'm just importing all of this and using that as, um, as the starting point for the discussion of, um, of our congruence. I'm going to come back to that uh, lead derivative equation in, uh, in a couple of minutes. But now I want to introduce a couple of uh, useful uh, tools. I want to introduce a decomposition of the metric into a time direction and a spatial uh, direction. I'll just write it out. So I have a preferred vector field in, uh, in space-time, which is the tangent vector field to the congruence. And uh, that can be defined basically as, you know, that can be used to define a preferred time direction in space-time. So uh, at every point in the <coughs> space-time where I have my vector field, I can pick the direction of that vector field to be a favored time direction. And I can basically put myself in a frame in which, you know, the vector field is oriented a long, uh, a long time at that point. And I can call that the time direction. And I can be working in a local Lorentz frame at that point, aligned with that time direction. That way of thinking is basically incorporated in, in this equation, which tells us that the metric can always be written as something that points entirely a long time. And the thing to do that is to form a tensor from something that has this time information in it. So basically, the only tensor that I can form from the thing that has the time information, which is the velocity field, is, uh, well, you know, the velocity field multiplied by the velocity field. And then what's left over is something that I'm going to declare is orthogonal to you and will represent the purely spatial pieces of the metric. So we have this piece. We have this condition 
that tells us that H is a purely spatial thing. And basically what we have here is the decomposition of the metric into a timepiece and a spatial piece. And if you want to know what H alpha really stands for, H alpha beta really stands for, well, it's just that. So given the metric, given the vector field, we can decompose the metric into something purely along the lines of the vector field, and then something left over. And what's left over is obviously the difference between this and that. And uh, yeah, that's what we get on the second line. I'll try to explain a little bit better what's, what's going on here so that you all see what the thinking is uh, behind this decomposition. But let me just work out a couple of good prop uh, a couple of interesting properties about this H. Well, first of all, I declared, so at this stage, I was declaring that H alpha beta has to be orthogonal to U. But, you know, since we know what it is, we might as well verify. So let's verify that if I multiply on the left with u, I get 0. If I multiply on the left with u, I can use this metric to lower the index on the vector field. So I get u beta. And here I get u alpha, u alpha that multiplies u beta. And this is equal to minus 1. So sure enough, I get 0. If I multiply on the right, well, it's the same story, right? Because it's a symmetric tensor. So we get u alpha, uh, u alpha from, uh, from over here. We get u alpha that multiplies u beta, u beta. That's equal to minus 1. That's, again, 0. So if I wanted to invent a metric that represents really the spatial displacement in my congruence, that would be a pretty good candidate. That would be a pretty good candidate. That would be a pretty good candidate, I should say again. Because that part of the uh, because that part of the that piece of the metric is completely orthogonal to what I declared to be the time direction, which is the direction of the vector field U. So that's one thing that tells us that we're on the right track here by you know by introducing something like this. And I could introduce this as a definition. And I'll call it the transverse metric. This piece over here would be the longitudinal metric. And longitudinal refers to the, you know, the preferred time direction given by the congruence. Uh, another property that's interesting is that um, I won't prove it here, but it's, it's really very uh, trivial. If you multiply h with itself, you get h back. And that's really trivial. You just multiply what h stands for, and you do the work, and you find that this holds. Another thing that uh, you can verify is that the trace of h is equal to 3. Because the trace of h is going to be equal to the trace of the metric, which is 4 plus the trace of this guy, which is u alpha u alpha, which is minus 1. So you get 3. So what do we have here? Well, h is really a projection operator. And it's a projection operator that takes you, you know, away from the uh, direction as u into the orthogonal directions, which I'm defining here to be the spatial direction. So the direction of u is going to be the time direction for us. Everything orthogonal to u is, uh, is uh, a spatial direction. H is orthogonal to U. H has this property that projection operators have. And, uh, and therefore, you can think of H as something that you know, projects down to the purely orthogonal uh, part of the space uh, time orthogonal to U. So it's really a projection operator. But then let me go back to this, because that was really the starting point. And let's make sure that this is something we all see very clearly. Why does it come from? 
So let's imagine that we're you know, selecting a point here somewhere in a congruence. Let's say this point over here. And I'm, I'm going to be introducing here a, a local Lorentz frame at that point. And I'm going to align the time direction of that Lorentz frame to be aligned with uh, the direction of the vector field at that point. So in a local Lorentz frame, momentarily co-moving with the reference geodesic, we know that in that special frame, the velocity vector is going to be pointing purely in the time direction in that frame. That's what I've been saying all the way. We also know that in that coordinate system, the metric is minus 1, plus 1, and a bunch of zeros. If I want to invent a notion of a spatial metric in that frame, I know that what I need to do is to preserve those plus ones, but take out this minus one. So the h alpha beta I would like to have in that frame would be one where I kill off the entry uh, up here, but I keep all the other ones. That would be what I would mean by a spatial metric uh, in that frame. And now the remaining question is, well, how do I define this tensorially from this and that? And it's pretty clear that if, if I need to kill off this entry, what I need to use is this one over here. Right. So if I want this and I have that, then it's pretty clear that what I need is this definition because this multiplying by that will give me a plus one that will kill off this minus one and will produce the zero that I wanted over here. So uh, the bottom line is that, well, this is something I could, you know, guess by just working locally like this in the local Lorentz frame. I play around with this, that's what I want, and I declare that this is going to be the proper tensorial definition. Uh, I first get it by playing around in the Logan frame, but this is a tensorial equation involving a whole bunch of tensors, so it's fine. It's valid in any coordinate system, in any frame, and that's basically the motivation for uh, doing this here or doing this here. You had a question? No. No? Okay. So that's a very uh, important thing that we're going to be needing. It's going to be uh, you know, a description. It's, it's, it's a notion, basically, of a metric tensor that uh, applies only in the spatial directions. And that, you know, what I mean by that is the directions that are everywhere transverse, everywhere orthogonal to, direct, uh, to the direction of the time-like vector field. So that's why I called it the transverse metric. And that's something that really describes the spatial structure around, uh, around the congruence or within the congruence. And, uh, and you know, this will be very important for what we're going to be talking about next. Okay. Okay, so having introduced this, I'm going to come back to that equation over here. If you look at this, you'll recognize that from what we talked about before. So the behavior of a neighboring geodesic relative to the reference geodesic is captured by that equation, which states that the rate of change of the deviation vector as I follow the congruence in time is going to be given by the gradient of the velocity field times the displacement vector. Ring the bell? Yeah. 
So I'll call it B alpha beta C beta, and B alpha beta is the gradient velocity field. So we've seen that in the fluid case. In the fluid case, this was the result of a Taylor expansion truncated to leading order. Here, there are no approximations. It's an exact treatment. By the way, this, you know, this comes out as an exact equation precisely because we've made sure to define the deviation vector as tangent to cross curves. You can find treatments of this in older literature where the displacement vector is defined in a sort of pedestrian way uh, as, you know, as a difference between, you know, coordinates here and coordinates there. And if you do that, well, you run into trouble, first of all, conceptually in terms of differential geometry, but you also introduce an essential approximation that tells you that this is, you know, only valid at first order. But if you do it properly the way we've done it in terms of tangent vectors to cross curves and all of this, this turns out to be uh, completely uh, exact with no approximation. But this is an equation we can recognize. It's basically the congruence equivalent to the equation that was our starting point in the fluid case. This is the rate of the, you know, this is the rate of evolution of the uh, of the deviation vector, which is linear in the deviation vector times uh, the uh, gradient velocity field. Right? So that's a nice equation. Lots of lots of uh, lots of content in that equation. And what I want to do now is to bring it up. In the fluid stuff that we did, nothing had time components to them, right? Our vectors were purely spatial. Here we have some notion of that too, because you know my deviation vector is also purely spatial. It has no time component. Well, let's see what else we have. So we have D. So let's work out whether D has any time components to them, to it. And the claim is that there are no time components. So uh, we can prove very quickly that D alpha beta is zero if you, uh, if you multiply it by U beta. So its time component in the second index is going to be zero. And its time component in the first index is also going to be zero. So B is a purely spatial tensor. or purely transverse, if I keep my uh, terminology straight. Other than that, of course, B is going to be some matrix, some tensor that has no particular properties, no, no particular symmetries. And the same decomposition that we used before for B uh, in the fluid case, we're going to do it also here for the, uh, for the congruence case. But that I'll do in just a second. First, I want to prove this right here. Well, the first one is obvious. B alpha beta u beta is just u alpha comma beta, semicolon beta, uh, u beta. And that's 0 by virtue of the beauty of this equation. So if I was dealing with a congruence of time-like curves that are not geodesics, that statement would not be true, and we would have to work a little harder. But this statement now is uh, automatically true. For the other guy, we get u alpha, u alpha semicolon beta. And we've done something like this before. I claim that this is the same thing as u alpha, u alpha differentiated with respect to beta. And that's 0 because the velocity field is normalized to minus 1 everywhere. So both properties are true, and therefore b alpha beta uh, is a purely spatial tensor. Well, the B matrix that we were dealing with before in the fluid case was also purely spatial. So the decomposition of B into irreducible pieces that we used before can be used here too. It's going to be the same thing. It's going to involve exactly the same ingredients because we're really dealing with the same kind of object. I mean, we write it in terms of space-time tensors, space-time indices. So formally, it has additional pieces to it. But those pieces are trivial. They're zero by virtue of that. 
So in the local Lawrence frame of that time over here, that guy will always have zero entries of all time and will be purely spatial in that frame. And therefore, in that frame, there, you know, the decomposition will be exactly the same between C and C4. So I'm going to introduce exactly the same decomposition of B in terms of irreducible pieces. Everything will have you know, space-time indices because we are working in space-time. But the very important point here is that, well, in fact, the time entries are trivial. And really, we are dealing here with purely spatial tensors. So anything that I said in the fluid case that was purely spatial in, in nature applies directly, because this is also purely spatial in nature. So the decomposition will be the same. The interpretation of all the terms is going to be exactly the same. So that's why I, you know, I took the time to do it for the fluid case, because I don't want to do it again here. The interpretation is really exactly the same. You have a question? Yeah, so they're only trivially zero if it's a finely parameterized space. Yeah. So if it's not, you if don't you, lose all the other. Right. So if I didn't do that, if I chose an arbitrary parameterization, then you know one of those guys would not be zero. Uh, instead of that, we would have something involving kappa uh, and involving the velocity field again. There are ways to deal with that. I mean, you can again, you can you can work around that, but it introduces you know complications that are really not essential. Although I should point out that you know at some point we're going to be doing this for the null case. For the null case, it turns out to be very useful for many applications to have an unaffined parameterization, and uh, and uh, for those cases we'll have to you know so we'll have to come back to that issue when uh, when we deal with the null case. We could deal with this issue right here, but I didn't think it was you know, important to do it here. But yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let me just do that, and then we'll quit. And before we quit, I'll give you the um, um, the homework assignment before I forget. So, decomposition of B. So, B alpha beta, again, is something that by itself doesn't have any symmetries. So, we break it down into a bunch of things that do have a lot of symmetries. The first guy is going to be the trace term. But notice that I'm not defining this in terms of the full metric. I'm using the spatial metric instead, the, long, the, uh, the transverse metric, because I know that this is something that should not have time components to, to it. And I'm going to build it up from things that don't have time components to them. So I'm using the spatial metric here. I'm defining a shear tensor. And I'm defining a rotation tensor. And again, these things have you know, Lorentz indices to them. We're talking about space-time tensors. But we are talking, in all cases, about space-time tensors that have no zero entries if you work in a local commutant frame. So all of those tensors are going to be orthogonal to B. So that means this one, this one, this one, and that one. That's going to be the expansion parameter, the expansion scalar. This is going to be the shear tensor. And this is going to be the rotation tensor. And because this is essentially the same equation we encountered in the fluid case, and because this is essentially the same decomposition that we encountered in the fluid case, the interpretation for all of these things is, is exactly the same. So theta is defined to be uh, the trace of uh, B alpha beta. And you can verify that this is, uh, you know, th there's no contradic uh, contradiction between this and that. Because if I multiply this, uh, this equation here by H alpha beta, I get H alpha beta multiplied by H alpha beta. And from the equation I have over there, that's, you know, that's the trace of H alpha beta, which is 3. 
So you kill off the one third, and you pick up nothing here, and you pick up nothing there, uh, because uh, this has no trace part. This has uh, this is anti-symmetric. So that's the definition of theta. But in fact, we could write it also in terms of the full metric, because the difference would be a term in u u, and that would kill the b, because b is orthogonal. So this is really the proper definition, but we can write it in this form. And if we write it in this form, what this means is that we're talking about the covariant divergence of the velocity theory. Sigma is defined to be, well, the symmetric part of B alpha beta minus its trace piece. That's an H. And uh, omega is defined to be the anti-symmetric part of E. And when you put it all back together, uh, with those definitions, well, you get this equation back. And I could, you know, I could write it right now. So all of these things have the same interpretation as in the fluid case. And one example is that the expansion parameter is now going to be given by the proper time derivative of, uh, of volume elements. So the picture here is that you know as you follow trajectories, you take the transverse view, and you have basically uh, volume elements. Sorry. So you have your reference word line over here. You have a bunch of word lines around it. So you can define a cross-sectional volume that is anchored by, uh, by, the, uh, by the geodesics. And as you follow the behavior of all those geodesics, you find that those cross-sectional volumes change. I mean, the shape, of course, the shape of those cross-sectional volumes will change. That's going to be governed by uh, the shear tensor. They're going to rotate or twist. That's going to be governed by the rotation tensor. But the overall scaling or shrinking, you know, expansion or you know, shrinkage of, the, uh, of, uh, of those cross-sectional volumes will be governed by the expansion parameter. And you know, following basically the line of reasoning that we followed in the fluid case, we can show, and I have other ways of showing this in the book, that theta is really the fractional rate of change of those cross-sectional volumes as you follow the behavior of neighboring fluid elements or neighboring you know, geodesics around that reference sweep. So same mathematics, same spatial properties, and basically same interpretation. OK, so I'll quit now, but I just want to give you your first homework assignment before I forget. And then we'll reconvene this afternoon. So a few problems from chapter one. So section 113, I want you to do problem number three, problem number six, and problem number nine. And in section 2.5, I'll give you more problems in the second homework. But right now, I want you to work through number one and number three. And I'm giving you two weeks to do that. So I want them back by February 8th. So that's two weeks from now. And February 8th is also the time where I need you to have submitted your, uh, your proposal for a term project. So, so far I've, rece I've received one proposal. So all of you are registered in the course have to get back to me for approval before February 8th. And as I told you before, what I need is a paragraph from you, you know, explaining what you intend to do, uh, what sources you intend to, uh, to work from, and, uh, and all of that. So uh, it's not too late, but uh, that deadline is approaching. So please, uh, please give it some thought. OK, any questions before we quit for lunch? OK, so I'll see you back here at 3.30.